Last Sunday morning we were able to only get through one of our translations, English translations in the 20th century that we've been studying. That was number seven, A.S. World's New Testament, done in 1904. We got camped out there, I think, a little while extra because I was telling you some of our own background to being introduced to Worrell as well as looking at some of those interesting uh, notes that he has, particularly concerning the man-child and the overcomers in the book of Revelation. And he sees several different aspects, at least a couple of different aspects to the rapture. Only the ones that are prepared are the ones who are going up, Hallelujah. first of all. And I'm, I just mentioned, I, I brought mine, some of you took a look at it, and I said I think years ago we paid $10 for it, and so that got me thinking, and I dug back into our old checks, and eight years ago, how you like that memory, $10 for, <laughs> for that translation. I save everything if it's got any type of memory to it, as you know. That's why they had to build me a small museum down there to hold all of it. But this was the ninth check that we ever wrote. I mean, we were just married. We just moved to Minnesota. We'd been there a couple of months. And this was the ninth check that we had ever written. And I looked over those nine checks, and I found it interesting that four of them were to pay bills, and five of them were for spiritual things. <laughs> and we didn't have any income, so it wasn't a time to be spending any money. That was for sure. And I noticed that of those five that were for spiritual things, uh, two went for books, one went for tapes, and two were gifts to other people. So that was interesting, so you may want to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So what I'm going to do this morning now is make up, make up for the time not lost last week, but the time we spent on one by covering several this morning because none of the ones we're going to look at this morning are that important. I brought a few of them along, but they're not ones that you have to rush out and get. So let's start with number eight. We'll be on... <laughs> Number eight, the 1911 Tercentenary Commemoration Bible. Tercentenary What's Tercentenary mean? 300. Three. 300 years, yeah, it's third. <clears throat> the 1911, you should listen to that first part, 1911. The 1911 tercentenary, subtract 300, what do you have from that? The KJV, right? All right, this is the 300th year anniversary for the King James Version of the Bible, which is this book right here, 1911 tercentenary commemoration Bible. I'm sorry about the big name, but that's really what it goes by. It was to celebrate, of course, the 300th year of the KJV's publication. <clears throat> and so obviously the year is 1911 that we're on. Uh, the last one was World's 1904. So we're skipping from 1904 to 1911 because we don't have any uh, significant translations meanwhile. And so what we have here, the uh, Oxford University Press gathered together a number of noted evangelical scholars at the turn of the century. In order to do this work, a commemorative edition, you know how you can get commemorative coins and stamps and things? Well, that's what this is supposed to be, a commemorative edition of the Bible. It was kind of like a limited um, uh, press run. I don't think that they really did that many copies because uh, the wording is not a lot, di lot different from what either the KJV had or some other translation. So I think it was kind of like a limited edition, and you don't find that many of them either then or today. The preface, which is only one page long, most prefaces go into a lot of detail telling you what was done. The preface, which is just one page long, tells us the following things. These are the things, if there are anything, of any note concerning the 1911 Tercentenary Commemoration Bible. Number one, it tells us that this is the work of 34 Hebrew and Greek scholars, although their names are not given. Now, it's not like the 20th century New Testament we discussed earlier where that was the work of private people, private individuals who wanted to remain anonymous in the work. 
and I think they were doing it for spiritual reasons. Um, I don't think that's the case here, but because scholars did do the work and others knew who did the work or who had done the work, but uh, most of them are not well known today, so there's no sense in uh, repeating them that you can glean from other sources. And then secondly, another thing that was told to us in the preface was that a new system of paragraphing was built in. A new system of paragraphing. KJV, remember, indents every verse. It treats every verse as a paragraph in itself. Well, the numbers to the verses are still found over the far left-hand side of each column, like you have in the KJV in most Bibles. But what they do is they skip a space whenever we've got a different paragraph. Like in Matthew, uh, Mark 9, you get verses 1 through 5, then down to verse 8, and then a blank space, and then 9 and 10, and then a blank space. That was their way of showing a different paragraph system and what you find in the KJV. The third thing that is interesting to note, maybe this is the most interesting thing to note about the 1911 Bible, is that a new system of chain references, now this isn't notes, this are the, these are the cross references found in the center of the page, the center column. A new system of chain references, totally new, that was not based on any earlier work, was provided. And these were the work of C.I. Schofield. So that's interesting to me that Schofield had a hand in this Bible. Now those aren't his notes. This isn't Schofield's Bible. Uh, Schofield, for his Bible, simply used the KJV text and um, gave us notes accordingly, according to his dispensational theology. But Schofield was one of the very noted evangelical scholars. Uh, and I take this opportunity to say something that maybe I've said before, that anyone who disagrees with dispensationalism, uh, like the covenant reform people, always try to paint the dispensationalist as some type of um, eastern Kentucky backwoods type person who has no knowledge, no understanding. He just jumps into the Bible and splits it up into different dispensations and so forth. Well, that's really the same thing that liberalism does to modern-day evangelical uh, uh, scholastics and scholarly work. You, you, try to, you try to ridicule your opponents not by challenging the, um, the worth of their material, but by a caricature of them as a person or a scholar as people. But C.I. Schofield was a noted scholar. He was a linguist. He was a theologian. Of course, that's not a blank check agreeing with everything Schofield ever wrote. He was wrong in some things. But he was not just a lay person that got into the Bible, invented something, and now his system has spread all over the United States. It's simply not true. That is a false caricature that you often read in Reformed writing, covenant writing. Anyone who disagrees with dispensationalism uh, will try to characterize Schofield as that. Now, maybe a lot of the people who've used Schofield have been wooden-headed literalists, but that's not true of Schofield himself. We happen to be dispensationalists in some senses of the term, in some aspects, although we don't follow everything that Schofield had to say. So that's what we find in the preface. Then in the back of the Bible, we've got 15 maps. They're prefaced with an index to all of them. It's telling you a little of what we find here. Uh, they're maps that are similar to uh, what you find elsewhere. They're color, but they're not exactly what you find in modern day Bibles. I think they're like all pastels. Yeah, they're all pastels, dull colors, you know, pinks, yellows. I think you've got some greens on one of these maps. Oh, yeah, there's some greens. Those are what I call pastel maps there. Now, it differs from the 1611 KJV in that the Textus Receptus is sometimes often left behind. In other words, this isn't just a reprinting as the commemorative edition of the KJV, just a reprinting of the KJV of 1611. Sometimes the Textus Receptus, the received text, is left behind. For instance, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the ending of that verse, that seems to have drawn some of verse 4 into it, the correct text of verse 4 of Romans 8. Uh, they leave that behind. The reading of 1 Corinthians 6.20, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The in the spirit is a TR Byzantine reading. That's left behind. But then there are a lot of times you simply follow the TR. So I don't really know what was their uh, 
guideline or their uh, rule of standard to go by. Archaic words such as leasing, do you remember what leasing means in the KJV? It's not like renting, you know, a Hertz or Avel, Avis rent a car or something. What does it mean? Lying. lying, yes, it means lying. So that's changed to lying, for instance, in Psalm 4, 2 and 5, 6. In other words, the language is updated. The word prevent, in 1611 Elizabethan English, what did that mean, prevent? Precede, just the opposite. Psalm 88, 13. <clears throat> That's now changed to precede, or I think the translation here is come before. And in Matthew 23, 24, where Jesus said that you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, well, remember that strain at a gnat was a uh, misprint, was a typographical mistake years ago with the 1611. And it's just persisted down to this day in modern editions of the 1611 or of the KJV. And so correctly, they take at, out, and put the word out in. Strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Not strain at. You don't strain at gnats. You strain them out of drinks. Of course, you're not supposed to be having any gnats in them. I don't drink them with gnats in mine, but I guess if you do, then you strain them out. And then you drink the drink after you've got the gnats out. So the 1611 Tercentenary Commemoration Bible, number eight. Number nine, see these aren't important, so we won't spend a whole lot of time with them. The Holy Scriptures according to the Masoretic Text. The Holy Scriptures according to the Masoretic Text. We're up into war years now, 1917. What, is, what do you know already from just the title of the work? It's Old Testament, so it was done by whom? Jews. It's a Jewish work, and since there's no Masoretic text for the New Testament, obviously this is only an Old Testament. An Old Testament done by Jewish people in 1917 that remained until the early 1980s, this decade, the standard English translation of the Old Testament. This is what all Jewish people, if they've used the Bible over all these last, well, 70 years, 80 years, have used. The Holy Scriptures according to the Masoretic Text, 1917. Now this is the first of at least two Jewish works that we're going to discuss in our march to the 20th century in English translations. And so you'll need to remember this, although I'm sure whenever we get to the later one, I'll come back to it. You need to remember this when we get to the later one in the early 1980s, because there is a connection between the two. So let's start with a little history. This seems to be important enough that we need to go back and give us a little history concerning this English Old Testament. Of course, it's translated from the Hebrew so that Jewish people in England and in the United States can read their Old Testament. Jewish people who can't read Hebrew can read their Old Testament. <clears throat> and remember, up until the revived modern state of Israel in the late 1940s, uh, Hebrew was, in essence, a dead language. So people, unless you were a trained rabbi or scholar or something like that, no Jewish people spoke Hebrew, or few Jewish people spoke Hebrew. And we've seen a revival in that, of course. And especially people in the United States would not have spoken Hebrew. And, of course, a lot of Jews still today in the United States cannot speak Hebrew. But more today can than in earlier days. Well, let's go back, first of all, to an important rabbi in the early 1800s whose name was Isaac Leeser. L-E-E-S-E-R. -E -E Isaac Leeser. <coughs> He was the rabbi who first introduced the preaching in English, the preaching in English in a Jewish synagogue in the United States. The synagogues aren't just in the diaspora that we've been studying on Friday nights around here. Synagogues are all over the world, and I think everyone is aware of that here anyway. But the Jewish people operated uh, in a similar fashion to the Roman Catholics, where the Roman Catholics for years, everything was done in the old language of liturgy, Latin. You did it in Latin even though you didn't live in the country of 
Latin or Italy. You didn't, you, people didn't speak that, but you kept it in the, the ancient language. Well, this was the practice of the Jewish people in synagogues in countries where people didn't speak Hebrew. The, all of the reading and all of the teaching and all the preaching was done in Hebrew. And so the people just sat out there and just nodded their head. And, you know, you kind of knew enough. If you were a Roman Catholic, you knew enough Latin to kind of know what was being said, at least at crucial liturgical moments. You'd heard it so often that at least you had it memorized, even though you might couldn't translate it into English. You could quote it all in Latin. Well, a lot of the Jewish people were like this. They knew some of the Hebrew phrases. They knew some of what the Hebrew phrases meant. I mean, like when we get our term Sabbath, that's just a transliteration of Sabbat which is the Hebrew term. So, I mean, we even know a little without knowing Hebrew. They knew a lot more. But this was a very important event in, in Judaism in English-speaking countries was this man, Isaac Leeser, introducing in the early 1800s for the first time the preaching in English in Jewish American synagogues. And then he made an English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament in 1853. I mean, Martin Luther did things that were similar. Martin Luther is not only so well known for the role that he played in, in the Reformation in tacking his 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg Chapel, October the 31st, 1517, but he's also well known for translating the Bible into German to give the people a Bible in their own native tongue. And this is exactly what Leeser is doing, translating the Hebrew Old Testament into English in 1853 and that Bible then became the favorite obviously it was the only one of United States and British synagogues for years to come now we're leading up to say something about the 1917 translation here it was quite a bit different from the KJV the KJV's Old Testament a translation done by a Jewish rabbi, a Hebrew scholar, into English that ended up being quite a bit different from the KJV. And that seems to be due to the fact that Leeser drew heavily from the German Bibles, German translations. Uh, Luther's being one, but there have been many various German Bibles. Leeser obviously knew German. And then at the second biennial meeting of the Jewish Publication Society of America in 1892, Plans were made to revise this work. And here's where we bring the Holy Scriptures according to the Masoretic text into the picture. That was done in 1853, the first work by Leeser. Now in 1892, plans are made to revise this. It's been about, you know, 40 years since Leeser's work came out. And so the man who was appointed as the chairman of the revision work was Morris, Dr. Morris Jastrow, J-A-S-T-R-O-W. Dr. Morris Jastrow <clears throat> was selected as the chairman of the revision committee. And maybe this doesn't mean a whole lot to us here, but that's probably because we're Gentiles and not Jews. It would mean a lot to them. And so in 1892, the second biennial meeting of the Jewish Publication Society of America, and of course the Jewish Publication Society of America is their chief publishing arm. It still is today. I mean, that's been in existence for a couple of hundred years, and it still is today. Your important Jewish works often are still sponsored by the Jewish Publication Society of America. Well, whenever they began working on a revision of Leeser's 1853 translation, they realized that they we're going to have to do an entirely new translation. Revision just wasn't enough. And you know, sometimes we've seen that earlier. They start out with the idea to revise, and they find out that revising the work is just not enough. We just won't be satisfied with revising it. We're going to have to start all over and do it from scratch. So Jastrow is the head of this project, and that's exactly what they decide to do. Now, I say that's what they decide to do. Deciding to do it and doing it are two different things. The complexity of the work caused a standstill for some time. And very little work was done between the years 1892 and 1908. Very little work was done between the years 
1892 and 1908. Any Bible translating work is a complex endeavor, especially if you've started off on the foot of revision, because that's in the back of your mind. We, you know, we don't want to spend our time doing an entirely new Bible or translation into English here. Let's simply revise. But then you say, no, that's not good enough. We have to go all the way. And so you've got two thoughts you're dealing with, and it becomes rather complex and so nothing is done from 1892 to 1908 with the exception of the book of Psalms. Psalms was translated into English, a fresh new translation in 1903. Now Psalms is like a favorite book for the Jewish people maybe not as important to them as the Pentateuch, but then the Pentateuch is awfully involved. Psalms is um, rather easy to translate. You've got a lot of parallelism. If you've got uh, synonymous parallelism, then one line essentially tells you what the next line means, so you don't really have problems of translation then, or at least problems of determining the meaning. So that almost cuts the work in half from 150 chapters down to 75. Well, finally in 1908 then, diligent work actually begins on this Bible. And you already have the concluding year. The entire Old Testament was completed in 1917. The entire work is done from 1908 to 1917, which also includes a revision of the 1903 Psalms. Now the preface to this work on page 7, claims of the book, and I quote, it aims to combine the spirit of Jewish tradition with the results of biblical scholarship, ancient, medieval, and modern. So it was a rather comprehensive work that took into consideration all different types, not just the Masoretic text, but all different recensions of the Masoretic text as well as other quotations of Old Testament material in the rabbis of the early centuries, which would not necessarily coincide with the reading of the Masoretes. Now, as I said, this was a very popular work for Jewish people. Remember now, just Jewish people in America and in England. It was often reprinted. By 1950, it had gone through 24 printings. 24 printings with a half million copies in people's hands. By the year 1980, there were a million copies. Now, that may not sound like a very large number, and I guess in one sense it isn't when you think of how many Jewish people you have just in New York City. Then a million copies of their English Old Testament over a period of 70 years or 60 years doesn't sound like a lot. And I, I would say that's true. The number of reprinting shows that it's popular. The uh, small number, comparatively speaking, of Bibles actually available, let's say, by 1980, probably shows the fact that uh, most Jewish people aren't people of a book anymore, not people of Jewish people of secular America or the secular West. They're not that concerned about their Old Testament heritage. When it comes time for one of their little feast days and they wear their little beanie caps and little skull caps and light their little candles and eat lots of sweets and have a lot of fun, well, that's one thing. But then to have to read the Bible, read the Old Testament, that's another. So that would be the only way I would think we could explain a rather small number, comparatively speaking, of a million copies available by 1980. When you think whenever Protestant translations are done and there are already just tons of them available, you may sell two million, three million copies in the first year. And we're talking about 70 years here before we top a million copies that were sold of this. So that just shows Jewish people don't read their Bible. Most Jewish people here in America don't read their Bible. You know that they're more concerned with their little technical um, odd holidays and festival seasons. They're more concerned with that because you get to eat a lot and have grandma and grandpa and papa and mama over and have a lot of fun and talk about the old country if you came from Europe over here or something. But 
to get back in the Old Testament and obey those moral laws? Well, maybe a lot of Jewish people wouldn't be so rich today if they obeyed those moral laws. So they just don't read. They stay out of the Old Testament. Of course, we're not criticizing Jewish people. We love Jewish people. I'm just trying to explain statistically why we end up with this. Uh, let me mention a couple of special editions that were made that were popular during uh, both World Wars, but particularly the Second World War. Some of these 24 reprintings or printings that I said earlier were actually special editions made for soldiers during both of the World Wars. For instance, one of these was entitled Readings from the Holy Scriptures for Jewish Soldiers and Sailors. Now, it wasn't an entire Old Testament like this one is that I have. I have a 1917 edition here. But it would be those bits and pieces, especially like, what, Psalm 3, where David said, even if, you know, if I lie down, 10,000 are against me, uh, I, I'll sleep. And So you get all those scriptures that give you hope and encouragement and comfort in the midst of battle, and you print that up for your Jewish soldiers and sailors. I'm smiling because that sounds just typical of human nature to just pick out of the Bible whatever you need for that day or that year or that um, endeavor. You pick all the, you know, the Psalm 23 passages out. <coughs> and if you were a Christian, you'd pick Romans 8 and things like that. Then here's another one, readings from the Holy Scriptures. This was World War II. I think the first one might have been World War I. Uh, readings from the Holy Scriptures prepared for use of Jewish personnel in the Army of the United States. That was the name of the Bible. Readings from the Holy Scriptures prepared for use of Jewish personnel of the Army of the United States. I think another good text might have been something like Exodus chapters 14 and 15 for military battle, or maybe Jehoshaphat's business in 2 Chronicles 20, any of those good Old Testament stories, and particularly the Psalms of comfort and encouragement would be included. The reading, I would say, is rather similar to the ASV's Old Testament. Rather similar, obviously there are differences, but rather similar, if I had something to compare it to, to the ASVs, the American Standards Old Testament. And for almost the entire 20th century, this work remained the standard Jewish translation of the Old Testament for the English-speaking world. It remained so right up into the early years of this decade. And we'll discuss what changed that at the very end of our study when we go chronologically and come up into the 1980s. But this remains the standard work for all of these years, up until the early 1980s, and um, I would imagine there are probably a lot of Jewish people who haven't bought the new Bible that's available for them, and so they still have this somewhere on their shelf or stuck away somewhere. A lot of people buy Bibles. Bibles seem like, well, if you don't read them, I think they're good for two purposes. Number one, you can keep a record of births and deaths and marriages and confirmations and baptisms in the front of it. And, of course, number two, you can press flowers. <laughs> so if you don't read it, I think there are two good purposes for Bibles. A genealogy of the family and pressing flowers. But I don't think that's what God's Word was intended for, to press roses or to record confirmations and baptisms. We come next of all, then, to... I should maybe be sending these around if you want to take a look at them. Not a lot to see. Uh, we next come to the Riverside New Testament, number 10. The Riverside New Testament, 1923. No, no one has a name Riverside for this. It was named after the publishers, Riverside Press. I've even seen some books done recently by Riverside Press. So I'm assuming it's still in existence. That's down in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I suppose they're beside a river is where they got the name. But that's the name of the Bible, the Riverside. And notice that it's New Testament. Number nine, the Jewish work was an Old Testament. This is a New Testament. It's the work of a congregational minister. 
by the name of William G. Ballantyne. B-A-L-L-A-N-T-I-N-E. William G. Ballantyne, who lived 1848 to 1937. As I say, he was a congregational minister. New England, as you probably have learned from being here, is a place that's, that's well known for congregationalism as a form of um, church, which means church government as well. You don't find in the rest of the United States a number of congregational churches that you find here. And your churches like your Unitarians and your Universalists, mm -hmm. which merged not that many years ago to become one denomination, they came out of the congregational church and background. So just about any church you hear, if it's not Unitarian, it's congregational. Of course, you got your Baptists and your Catholics, but your strong church in this area for a couple of hundred years has been your congregational church. And so that's his background, William G. Ballantyne. He also was one time the president of Oberlin Theological Seminary, O-B-E-R-L-I-N, Oberlin Theological Seminary seminary. He was president from 1891 to 1906. You know anything about Oberlin Theological Seminary? Any names connected with it in your mind? Now how about Charles G. Finney? Finney's name is connected very intimately. Uh, he was a professor there and a teacher there. This is in Ohio. So this is a school that has its roots in the views of Charles G. Finney. As a matter of fact, there's such thing today as Oberlin theology. Perhaps you can look this up in your dictionary on theology. Oberlin theology, which deals with the subject of perfectionism. Perfectionism. Uh, we've actually been by there on one of our vacations. I don't remember which one it was, but one of our vacations, we were going through Ohio and we went by here. Because that was a famous place. Of course, Charles Finney was a famous religious figure, especially in the second half of the 19th century in the United States. He traveled a lot in that area, Ohio River area. And this was actually, and still is, in Ohio. The Riverside New Testament. It's based on Nestle's 1901 Greek text. It's rather literal and it was slightly revised in the year 1920, 1934, rather, 1934. Number 11, the centenary translation of the New Testament. One year later, 1924. Now what stands out about this translation, a little small pocket one, as you can see here, probably what you'll best remember about it is, is that it is the only 20th century English Bible to be the work of a single woman. Most Bible translating work, as well as most scholarly theological work, as you well know, is done by men. This is the only 20th century English Bible to be the work of a single woman. Now women have worked on some of the committees which did some of the translating work. But, I mean, think of the translations like Moffat and Goodspeed and Williams and that go by the names of the person who did them and who are those people. Well, they're all men. This doesn't go by the woman's name. Her name was Helen Barrett Montgomery, generally just seen as H.B. Montgomery. It doesn't go by her name, but it is her work and her work alone. So it stands out as rather unique. The centenary translation. Now, what does centenary mean? You've got what tercentenary means, 100 years. So it's a celebration of something that must have happened in 1824 then, right? Well, we'll see what that is here in just a moment. Helen Barrett Montgomery lived 1861 to 1934. She was a resident of Rochester, New York. 
Rochester, New York, there's a seminary, Rochester Theological Seminary, which is where um, uh, A.H. Strong was a professor for so many years. So she also was a resident of Rochester, New York. She was an excellent Greek scholar, a good translator, and surprisingly enough in those early days, an ordained Baptist minister. That rules her out scripturally. Well, being a Baptist rules you out scripturally, so what's new? But she was a Greek scholar and a good translator. This is a modern translation, in other words, modern English. I just said Riverside was rather literal. Not, we haven't really discussed any modern translations. Not as modern as this yet this morning. But this is number 11, the centenary translation, the work of H.B. Montgomery. It's a modern translation based essentially on the text behind the ERV, the English Revised Version, which was the critically reconstructed text of the 19th century. What do you suppose this was published to celebrate the centennial of? Any guesses or ideas? Something happened in 1824, and they're celebrating in 100 years of it in 1924. Oh, you're close there. Something to do with the Baptist Church. Well, the American Baptist Publication Society, very similar to the Jewish Publication Society of America, was issued to celebrate the centennial of the American Baptist Publication Society. A few notes about <clears throat> this translation. Uh, Mrs. Montgomery gives us before each book a short introduction, very short, shorter even than the short ones that are found in the 20th century New Testament. For instance, I've opened up to Matthew, and here over on the left-hand page, it's just all summed up in a couple of short, abbreviated sentences, an introduction. <laughs> Who the author is, um, key verses, probable date, the symbol of the book, the method of the writing, and things on that order. Very, very short. She also wrote chapter headings. She also wrote chapter headings for every chapter of the New Testament. Uh, for instance, Philippians. And I picked this out because Maybe you're familiar enough with the four short chapters of Philippians to know what the topic of each chapter is. Here are the headings she gives. Like for Philippians 1, her heading for that chapter is A Great Voice Out of Prison. Remember Paul's in prison and he gets news that some people are preaching the gospel out of contention and strife. And his response is, well, however it's preached, at least it's being preached and may God be glorified through that second chapter she entitles weaving the fair pattern of the gospel you could probably think of a better heading than that but that's hers weaving the fair pattern of the gospel chapter three real religion and false formalism real religion and false formalism she calls it yeah, I saw this written in another book, and it had real religion and formalism. Um, but that was, must have been a mistake of someone else's research, because when I looked it up, it's got false before the term formalism. And in chapter 4, Paul's recipe for a life of victory. Paul's recipe for a life of victory. There you've got those famous verses like, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I can do all things through Christ, and my God will supply all my needs. So I suppose that's a fairly good title for the chapter, as well as his Think on These Things passage, Paul's Recipe for a Life of Victory. Now, one other thing, and I'll conclude her translation with this, that is notable about her work is that she divides every chapter up into the appropriate uh, uh, paragraph, the thought there, and then gives it a title as well. 
she gives a title for the entire chapter and then subtitles for every division in the chapter. And so there are just, of course, hundreds of these, hundreds of these. And let me take you to a few of them. First of all, we'll start over in First Epistle to the Corinthians. By the way, you may have noticed that something fell out of mine as I was holding it up. Uh, this is the covenant of the First Free Baptist Church in Wilmot Flat, North Carolina. And this is a covenant you're supposed to sign whenever you join the church. These are used Bibles like this is too. You, one of those is going around now that has an interesting note attached to the beginning. Whenever you buy old books, I like to go looking for old books and old Bibles if they're useful. And I'm an old book sniffer. You smell the book and you get a certain flavor from the book smelling it. But also you look for flowers and things like that. And don't look cross-eyed at me. Or that. You smell it. And you get a feel for it, you know. Maybe you don't know. People smell flowers, I smell books. This is to James Block, baptized February the 17th, 1927, into the First Baptist Church of Waterville, Maine. Signed, Leupold H. R. Hass, the pastor. And so I don't know how North Carolina and Maine got together, but that's, anyway, that's how, that's what we have here. But over in chapter 11, let's start in 11 in 1 Corinthians, verses 6 through 16. You know what she entitles this? Paul does not accept Jewish customs. Now that's about the wearing of the head covering there. Her title to that. So you see how much interpretation is involved in this Bible with these little headings. Right up here at the top of the page in bold print, Paul does not accept Jewish customs. That's rare that you see anyone that would say that's a Jewish custom. Most people say that was a Corinthian Gentile custom, the wearing of the, of the head covering. Certainly not a Jewish custom. So that's rather unique. Paul does not accept Jewish customs. The rest of this chapter, she has things like church quarrels, disorder at the Lord's Supper, the true origin of the Supper, the significance of the Supper. Chapter 13, the whole title of the chapter, The Greatest Spiritual Gift. That sounds like a Baptist title there. Well, love is never called a gift. It's called a fruit. Amen. But what she's wanting to do is say, this is the greatest gift here, love, and the gifts of the Spirit, those supernatural ones, are not necessary. In other words, you can tell that she sets you up here in a hurry. First three verses, she entitles, All Worthless Lacking Love, which is true. If you've got the gift, you don't have love. Paul said it doesn't do anyone else any good. Then the little section on love from verses 4 through 11, love is, that section, she entitles that, and I've heard someone else say this, a portrait of Jesus. That what Paul is doing there is actually describing Jesus under this figure of love is, love is, love is, and it doesn't do and it doesn't do. And then, of course, you know what we're going to get over in chapter 14. First 12 verses, she calls that prophecy superior to the gift of tongues. Well, Paul, the apostle Paul never taught that. He said prophecy superior to uninterpreted tongues. But he never says prophecy is superior to tongues. In verse 5, he said that they are on the same level. They're equal. Tongues without interpretation, he says, will not profit the hearer is anything. It profits the speaker. He's edified. He speaks mysteries to God in the spirit, but it doesn't edify the listeners or the hearers. So that's a false title to that section, Prophecy Superior to the Gift of Tongues. And then when we jump over into the end of this chapter, verses 34 through 40, and do you know what that portion is about? The end of 1 Corinthians 14? What does that deal with? The women, the woman question there. Remember, this is the woman doing it. So, of course, she wouldn't have any biases, would she? She entitles this question regarding women in the churches. That's, that's well enough. That's fine. And then here's what she does. Like, uh, let me do this for you in verse 34.
She has taken verses 34 and 35 and put them in quotation marks to show that that's not Paul speaking when he says that women are not to speak in the church, that Paul is quoting part of the letter that they wrote to him. That's why it's in quotation marks. Um, in your congregation, you write. And she put this in there to show that this isn't Paul's opinion. He's not saying that women must keep silent in the church. He's saying this is what you're writing about. As in all the churches of the saints, let the women keep silence in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. On the contrary, let them be subordinate, as also says the law. And if they want to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, end of quotation marks. And then Paul starts up in verse 36, what, uh, was it from you that the word of God went forth, or to you only did it come? And he starts with the rhetorical question here that would be uh, a criticism of this belief of theirs that women were to be silent. But that hardly seems to be the, the nature of the case in 1 Corinthians, especially in view of chapter 11, when the women are doing a lot of speaking. It seems like this wouldn't be their opinion that women are not to speak because why do we have all the women speaking so much then? They're doing a lot of speaking as well as the men and it seems like everybody is out of turn, out of order because we have evidently so many tongues that are not being interpreted. And the women speaking is a separate question from that specifically but generally speaking they're the same because it concerns utterance publicly when they, whenever the church meets together. And then she has a, a footnote to that on the term law and you often read this this can only refer to the oral law of the Jews. You let your women be subordinate as also says the law. This can only refer to the oral law of the Jews as no such prohibition is found in the law, capital L, the Old Testament. Paul is probably quoting a sentence from the Judaizers. That's what Charles Trombley taught us that morning that we heard his tape or I think that we heard part of one of his tapes concerning women in ministry. It's a typical claim, but it's a claim that's fairly easy to disprove as well. Uh, let me look. What, what else do we have? Romans chapter 8. What do we have? Oh, I remember. Romans 8, 31 through 39 is all a poem, or really a song, in her opinion. She entitles it, A Canticle of the Breadth and Depth of the Love of God in Christ. And nothing seriously wrong with that. Some people, we looked at a translation here not long ago of the man Way who wants to make so many things songs or poems, but it's said in verse that you can tell this was an early Christian song, in her opinion. Romans 8, 31 um, through 39. And then one last thing on her is 1 Timothy 3:16. <clears throat> She has, like Way and others right here, we've got it, an early hymn quoted, and here it's set in quotation marks and it's indented. And she even has a lot of it rhyming here. He in the flesh was manifested, in the spirit was attested, by the angels was beholden, among the Gentiles heralded, in the world believed on, and in glory taken up. That's not a very good translation. As I said with Way, if people actually sang it this way in the olden days, I don't know how they managed. I think the KJV is a lot better rendering if you're going to try to sing that. I don't think that would come out very well as a song. So the centenary translation of the New Testament. Let's see, we've got time for one more quick one, number 12. Here you go, brother. <clears throat> number 12, the concordant version, concord, like concordance, the concordant version of the sacred scriptures. Actually, the title has 93 words in it. So I've shortened it for us. <laughs> Simply, generally, it's just known as the Concordant Bible. C-O-N-C-O-R-D-A-N-T, Concordant, the Concordant Bible. But officially, it has a 93-word title. It's the work of one Adolf E. Koch and his assistants. 
It was named for the 25-year project of theirs, which was to make a complete concordance of the whole Greek language. That's where they got the title, Concordant Version, although this is in English. They had a 25-year project of making a complete concordance of the whole Greek language. So, by the way, this also was only a New Testament. The first of the New Testament began to appear in 1921. And the entire work was complete by 1926 in nine parts. Now, let me explain what I mean by this part. These were all put together in a loose leaf binder. They were just pages, individual pages, which have been put together in several parts, nine in total, and they come out at different times. You've even got loose leaf Bibles today where you've got, um, you know, it's like a, a notebook that clips together with the three rings in the middle that you can clip the pages out and everything. I've never used one of those, but I know, I knew someone at one time who carried one of those around. And that's what this was, uh, a loose leaf binder. It totaled 800 pages. Very large work. This is just New Testament now, 800 pages. On the left-hand page, they had the Greek text in uncials, which was unusual. Most of the time, well, in the early days, that's all they had. They wrote in uncials, but not in modern times. The Greek uncials, the, the larger letters, the capital letters, are oftentimes a lot different from the small letters. Some people can't even read the, the capital letters in Greek, all can read the small ones because you don't come across the capitals that often. So the, the left-hand page has the Greek text in uncials, means capital letters, with a literal sublinear <coughs> English translation. Literal means word for word. Sublinear means under the Greek text. And a literal sublinear English translation. That was all on the left-hand page. Then on the right-hand page was an idiomatic English translation. In other words, this was a modern speech, a modern language translation. The right-hand page, we have an idiomatic English translation along with a huge mass of notes, textual, historical, devotional, and so forth. Now, let me sum this Bible up under four quick points of observation. Koch and his assistants rejected all known Greek texts of the past, you know, the TR, the Textus Receptus, the 19th century critical work, the Reconstruction, they rejected all of that in favor of a totally new one that they made themselves. They had a totally um, innovative new idea on how to choose variants. I don't think it was a reliable way. It followed neither the TR nor the, tech, nor the 19th century critical work. So they rejected all known Greek text in favor of a totally new one of their own. Secondly, the Holy Spirit, whenever that appears in their Bible, the last word is always put in small letters. I don't know exactly why, except it doesn't seem like any of these men were conservatives in their theology. You have holy with capital H, then spirit small s. Now that may be true of some Bibles in the Old Testament, or maybe both words start with small letters, but it'd be rare to find that in the New. Thirdly, they felt that Hebrew was the only pure language. They argued very strongly that God conversed with Adam in the Garden of Eden in Hebrew. <laughs> we see that notion popping up every now and then. No one knows what language they spoke. Of course, you can be a person like the Neo-Orthodox who say, well, no speaking was done. They just communicated by thought. But I think that involves a, a huge critical reconstruction of the text there. <clears throat> you even have people who are supposed to be 
you know, conservative people, better known conservative people like Bernard Ram, who's done an important book on hermeneutics, who holds to that theory that they didn't talk any because basically he doesn't believe Adam ever existed. So however, whoever was there conversed with God, we really don't know, except probably it was by thoughts or impulses or something like that. <coughs> so Hebrew, they said, was the only pure language. That may have been one of the causes that had them reject a lot of the Greek text because Greek's not that reliable. It's the Hebrew thought pattern of the Jewish people behind it that's really reliable. And then fourthly and finally this morning, uh, the term or the thought of eternity. Remember how we've come across that several times now in Bible translating work? It's often toned down. It's often toned down. And we're talking not about Young's literal translation, not on the right-hand page of this, but a very idiomatic English translation. For instance, in places like Romans 16.26, Instead of eternal, you have words like this, eonic. Now that, of course, is the Greek term, eon, A-E-O-N, or the word from which we get eon, but as we've already discussed with Young's Bible, we don't need to go through that again. Um, eternal is the meaning of that, regardless of what the, quote, literal Greek has to say. The meaning, because it is a certain Greek construction, does refer to eternal existence, eternalness or eternity. But in Romans 16, 26, they have um, this term that we have up here. Okay, I think that that's enough for this morning. That takes us through number 12. Most of those, as you see, are not important. Then I will forewarn you next week, Lord willing, we'll be on number 13, which is a very important one, and that is the translation of James Moffat. So if you have Moffat's translation, you want to be sure to bring that along with you next Sunday morning. And we may not be able to get past Moffat's because Moffat's is a very important work. None of these that we've covered today are important. None of them you need to go out and, and purchase. Yes? Yes. Yes. Or the number 10, the Riverside. The theology you spoke of? Oberlin theology. Look it up in your dictionary on theology. I would guess they'll have a, an article on it. Concerns perfectionism. You know, Finney goes back, and that's the era of the um, Methodist circuit preacher. Of course, Methodist circuit preachers go back to the days of Wesley in England and back to uh, Whitfield here in this country in the 1700s. But you have a lot of discussion then about a so-called second work of grace. It was similar to, to Pentecostalism and the charismatic experience, but not exactly the same. They felt it was a subsequent work to salvation. Some of them called it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some didn't. Um, some believed that tongues was there. Most didn't. But be that as it may, most people believed it was some type of work of sanctification, that the believer could be saved you know, four years ago at your conversion experience, and then perfectionism, and then be sanctified in a special, unique, one time, once for all, subsequent to salvation, uh, sanctification experience, where the, the believer is then brought further than just salvation into a state of perfection. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion in the church's history over perfectionism. Is perfection possible for the Christian in this life? and lots of ins and outs. What type of perfection? Are we talking about absolute perfection where a person is not even temptable anymore? Are we talking about walking in the light that we have? All types of discussions have arisen and basically that's all studied in the theological area known as sanctification. What actually is sanctification? Does it mean that you stop sinning? Can you ever get to the point in your life where you don't sin? Could you ever get to the point in any area of your life, maybe not your whole life, but in any area where you simply don't sin in that area anymore? Um, I think a lot of evangelicals would say no, but I think common experience would say yes. I mean, you don't drink beer anymore, do you? You probably haven't had any for years and years now. You got to a place, you stopped sinning. I mean, there's one area you got to the place, you stopped sinning. Of course, what they want to discuss is what about, I mean, it's easy to stop drinking beer, smoking cigarettes. What about, you know, criticism or gossip or 
um, unbelief or you know areas like that all oh, those are more involved then well then that gets the discussion more involved to be sure but Oberlin theology perfectionism Charles G Finney yes um, are we to judge the, the, the translation of the work of the translators according to, by their character the somewhat yes somewhat? we'll see this with um, Moffat I think next time yeah I don't think that God intends for us to read a quote excellent translation by some apostate or by someone who holds to liberal views of things you hear the old the old evangelical or really the neo-evangelical argument is well if it's good it's good it doesn't matter who did it well i think it does matter i think there is probably a demonic work or a demonic uh, train of thought somewhere in that if this is some apostate fella or some man holding to a lot of liberal higher critical views that's why i kind of like the 20th century new testament because we know we're talking about a good group of basic evangelical conservative anonymous people not someone like a james moffat or a goodspeed um, who held various liberal theories about various things in the bible and yet they were excellent greek scholars and so their bibles have come to us now as the bible to read